Today, it is my great pleasure to welcome and chat with John Whittington Franklin, the son of the esteemed historian John Hope Franklin, and the grandson of Buck Colbert Franklin. B.C. Franklin was a well-known, courageous Tulsa attorney and one of Oklahoma's first African-American lawyers. Immediately after the Tulsa, Tulsa race massacre, B.C. Franklin erected a tent in the Greenwood area in the burned out ground and began representing individuals and businesses injured in the massacre and helping them with their claims. Now his grandson, John Whittington Franklin, is very accomplished in his own right. He is a scholar. He is a researcher who has specialized in the history and culture of Africa and its diaspora for the past 50 years. He has worked with the Smithsonian Institute and was one of the first staff members of the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C., where he served as a cultural historian and senior manager in the Office of External Affairs. He is currently senior managing emeritus at, uh, at uh, Smithsonian, and he is the managing member of the Franklin Global LLC. In this year of the centennial of the Tulsa race, race massacre, John is engaged in discussions in Tulsa, Oklahoma on facets of the commemoration of the massacre and its legacy. So John, let me ask you, your family has deep roots in Oklahoma, and even today, although you live in Washington, D.C., you have an abiding connection with this city, and you are a frequent visitor to Tulsa and an active voice in our community. Would you mind sharing with us your family's history in Tulsa and in Oklahoma? It would be my pleasure. Um, I'm deeply steeped in this history. I've been coming to Tulsa since I was two. I have a picture of my grandfather holding me as a two-year-old in Tulsa. Um, we arrive in Oklahoma in the 1830s as slaves to Chickasaw Indians, the Chickasaw Bernie family. United States Congress enacted the American Indian Removal Act in 1830, forcing American Indians to leave their lands, their ancestral lands, and walk to what was called Indian Territory, which we now know as Oklahoma. My great-grandfather, David Burney, holding the name of his owners, Burneys, the Burneys, uh, was born in 1820. And so as a teenager, he walks from Tennessee to an area in southern Oklahoma in the Arbuckle Mountains. Uh, where my grandfather will be born. Um, they're given land and they are black cowboys. They're ranchers, they have cattle, they have a farm, they have a spread as they call it. And um, my grandfather, my great grandfather uh, enlists in the Civil War Union Army as David Franklin. The various discussions of how he obtained his freedom, but we know that by the 1860s, he's going by David Franklin and he considers himself a free man. He has 10 children and one of them is my grandfather, B.C. Buck Colbert Franklin, named for his maternal grandfather, the Colbert, the Buck part. Um, people have been given this land, which is not near the ocean, Extreme weather, as you know, very hot, and as you're experiencing now, very cold. Um, and Grandpa clearly shows great promise from an early age. And uh, he learns how to rope cattle and goes with his father to the Panhandle, to Texas, to Arkansas, to Kansas and Colorado, taking their cattle to market. Um, he goes to Berwyn to a prep school called uh, Dawes Academy, similar to the Dawes Commission, the Dawes Academy. And he goes there in 1894, if I recall. I'm not looking at my notes right now. And he finishes what we would consider high school in 
and then goes off to college in Nashville. Uh, this is during deep segregation. Many opportunities are not available in public institutions that are for white males in Oklahoma. So he goes to a black Baptist college, Roger Williams University in Nashville, where he meets my grandmother to be, Molly Lee Parker. And um, I continue to learn about other classmates. You'll hear about one of them shortly. And uh, they study with a man named John Hope, who uh, becomes their mentor. And when he leaves to go to Atlanta Baptist, which we now know as Morehouse, my grandfather follows him in the late 1890s. Uh, but in 1896, he goes to Roger Williams. He begins to study. He's clearly a very good student. Um, and while he is meeting my grandmother and his classmates, oil is struck in Oklahoma and Tulsa becomes the oil capital of the world. And if you know anything about the allocations in the eastern half of the state, much of that land belongs to both Native, Native Americans and African Americans. So they're people who become wealthy, not just from the products of their, of their land, uh, cotton, uh, food crops, cattle. But then like the Beverly Hillbillies, there's oil in your backyard and your whole status changes and you begin negotiating with oil companies. Um, Grandpa returns to Oklahoma after college uh, and marries my grandmother in 1903. They settle in Springer, uh, Eufaula, and eventually Ardmore. And my grandfather apprentices in the law with a number of black lawyers in Ardmore. And he studies correspondence uh, with the Sprague Law School in Detroit and prepares himself to take the bar in 1907. He's admitted to the bar in December 1907. He's the second highest score in the state. He um, moves to Rennesville. He's not as successful as he had hoped. It's an all black town. Uh, he's a Methodist in a city run by Baptists and they don't trust him so they won't give him legal work. And uh, he sees a classmate of his from Roger Williams, his and my aunt and my grandmother's, uh, Effie Thompson, who marries a gentleman and the two of them have a drugstore, which they'll eventually move to, to Greenwood. And uh, Mr. Thompson suggests that my grandfather might do better in Tulsa. So next week, Today is February 12th. February 20th, 100 years ago, he moves to Tulsa. So next week, 100 years ago, he moves to Tulsa. And um, let me describe to you what businesses he sees then. From my notes from the talk yesterday. Leaving his wife and two youngest children, Anne Harriet and John Hope, he moves, leaving his wife and two youngest children, Anne Harriet seven and John Hope six, he moved into I.W. Thompson's rooming house in Greenwood. The community was prosperous and bustling with the Dreamland Theater, Caver's Cleaner, the Gurley Hotel, the Midway Hotel, the Stradford Hotel, Doc Eastman and Hughes Cafe, Carter's Barbershop, grocery stores, furniture and jewelry stores, real estate and oil leasing offices, restaurants, drug stores, professional offices of dentists, lawyers, and Mount Zion Baptist Church, Vernon AME, First Baptist Church North. I understand there were 13 churches in the, in the community at that time. Brick and frame homes. He met people like O.W. and Emma Gurley, J.B. Stradford, the renowned caterer Cleora Butler, was his next door neighbor. John and Lula Williams, who owned the Dreamland Theater. J.D. Mann and Tulsa Star editor A.J. Smitherman. He formed a law firm with attorneys I.H. Spears and T.O. Chappelle. Black Tulsans worked in Greenwood 
and for the many businesses and homes in White Tulsa. All of this, of course, was destroyed with the massacre of May 31st to June 1st. So he describes, uh, I have a document where he describes the massacre, the bombing from the air, uh, the shooting in the streets, people killed before his eyes as he's trying to contact the sheriff, the phone lines have been cut. He says at one point, where, oh, where is our fire department with its six stations? Is the city complicit with the mob, he says. And he has a very precise description of what it's like to be in a mob that has no sense of law or respect for the constitution. I thought it was particularly germane these days. The city council passes an ordinance after the community is destroyed saying that African-Americans have to rebuild with non-flammable materials. And Grand Pop views that as a land grab. You know how close Greenwood is to downtown. And this was probably moved by the city fathers to expand downtown beyond uh, north of the railroad tracks. Grand Pop encourages uh, his fellow citizens in Greenwood to rebuild with whatever they have, whatever burned out bricks, shacks, whatever to construct. And he fights uh, this ordinance successfully all the way to the state Supreme Court. We have a marvelous picture of him from June 6, 1921 with IH Spears and he, they've set up a law clinic on, on Greenwood. And uh, we have an image which I, I, I sent to you and I know you have, it's a very famous image, but he's sitting on the right uh, there are law books all on the brick floor. It's a Red Cross tent. He's facing his partner, I.H. Spears, and Effie Thompson, his classmate and my grandmother's classmate from Roger Williams, ask if she can be their secretary until she and her husband can rebuild their drugstore. So it's from that tent that they meet with the citizens of Greenwood who are trying to put their lives back together. Their homes are destroyed. They're the churches are down to the ground. And uh, Booker T, the original Booker T Washington, serves as a hospital uh, during that period. Um, and so it's a he's a catalyst for rebuilding the community and giving people the sense that we will survive this and we will build this community anew, which occurs. Um, People make claims on their insurances, none of which are honored by the insurance companies. That's when you go to the fine print, act of God, riots, lightning, et cetera. Um, and there's a list of those businesses uh, in front of the Greenwood Culture Center on that black marble uh, statue. And an estimate of how much each of those businesses claimed in losses. People were very resourceful and use this opportunity and their savings to rebuild their homes and rebuild their businesses to the extent that by 1924, they're well on the way to rebuilding. My grandmother comes from Rentersville with her two youngest children, my dad and his older sister, Aunt Harriet, as I called it, Anne Harriet. Um, and their mother, who is a school teacher, goes to the principal at Booker T and says, my children are ready for seventh grade. And uh, he puts them into seventh grade uh, and he graduates, my dad graduates from Booker T in 1931. And I have pictures of his high school graduation. I have pictures of him in the high Y club. And then grandpa continues to practice law in Tulsa, in Greenwood, on Greenwood for the next 40 years, from 1921 to his death in 1960. Um, I start going to Tulsa, as I said, as a two-year-old. Uh, unfortunately, since the coronavirus, I haven't been in the last year, but last year I went four times. Um, I always go for the John Ho Franklin reconciliation dinner the Thursday before Thanksgiving, which we of course did not have this past year and the annual symposium honoring my grand, my father, um, the John Hope Franklin Reconciliation and America Symposium occurs on or near the dates of the, of the massacre. This year in 2021, it will be May 26th to 28th. 
We just sent out the save the date. We have an exciting lineup of speakers, including Ed Dwight, who designed the park. He was the first black man trained to be an astronaut and became an artist. And Isabel Wilkerson, who has spoken uh, at the university before uh, when her book, The Warmth of Other Suns was out and her newest book is Cast, which is a powerful analysis of our society, uh, comparing the caste system in the United States to caste in India and the Germans, the Nazi Germans assessment of our racial policies. Uh, so we have an exciting lineup, June, uh, May 26 to 28. Oh, that is ama an amazing history and an amazing place where we are today. And, and when you think about the 1921 Tulsa race massacre, um, how did those stories, that tragic event, and your grandfather, B.C. Franklin, and his involvement in fighting injustice and recreating the Greenwood District and being a lawyer in Greenwood through the entire rest of his life, how did that influence you personally and professionally? Well, my father thought that he would return from college as a lawyer to assist his father. His father was working with all of these different cases, but not making any money. And he said they were, you know, remained in poverty. Um, and so he went off to Fisk, where he met my mother. Uh, and he fell in love with history. And he would come back to Tulsa every year for while his father was living. And then after his father passed in 1960, he would always come at least for his sister, his oldest sister, Mozella's birthday, August 10th. Uh, so he stayed in contact with Tulsa and um, took me there, as I said, very early. And I've gone every year I lived in, even when I lived out of the country, I would stop through Tulsa after visiting my parents to see my relatives, like aunt, uncle, and cousins in Tulsa. Um, my father told me about growing up there, how when he was a little boy, he heard about the massacre uh, in Rennesville. He and my mother, he and his mother and sister didn't know if my grandfather had survived or not. Um, when they came back to, when they came to Tulsa, um, you must realize that Tulsa was a very segregated city. Uh, there were the signs of white and colored. There were places you could not go. You could not try on clothes all of the things that go with segregation. Um, and dad was the top student at Booker T. And there was a tradition of a luncheon for the valedictorian of Booker T and the valedictorian of Central. A Central was the white high school. It's a block long that had a swimming pool that had many facilities that Booker T never had. Um, and so he was invited to the luncheon at the Mayo Hotel in their ballroom with his advisor. And they never got to meet the Central High School valedictorian. They were at separate tables and they were never introduced. So dad goes on from Fisk to Harvard and uh, becomes a historian, does his research, his focus, his specialty is the history of the American South, 18th and 19th century. So I grew up in a household where my mother's a librarian, my father's a historian. And I think that after dinner, you clear the table and you write books. That's what my household was. So when the Emancipation Proclamation Centennial was coming up, I learned the word emancipation. I learned the word centennial. I'm only 11, 10, 11. I learned the word centennial, and then dad produces a book, The Emancipation Proclamation, 1963. Um, so I'm shaped by a deep understanding of American history, the good and the bad. My father said America prefers the happy history. Leave out slavery, and leave out the American Indian, and leave out the Japanese internment. Um, and so when I'm in middle school in New York, moving to Chicago, 
he writes the first inclusive textbook for eighth graders. And he writes it with two white professors, one from UCLA, one from Harvard. And they write it with the California adoption, state adoption in mind. It's the biggest school system in the country. And he gets his first death threats because they have the UN. They have an overseer with a whip. And the John Birch Society says, we, that's not the history we want to hear. This is in 1966. And I'm a proofreader, child labor. I'm re proofreading the, this textbook for my dad and his colleagues in LA. I'm proofreading, looking for mistakes. Uh, and the John Birch Society has a hundred car caravan from Southern California to Sacramento to protest the adoption. Of the book is adopted. But I'm beginning to see the culture wars at a very early age. Um, I start studying French in New York public schools. We live in England when I'm 10. I have to actually use my French for the first time in Morocco and in France. And that gives me an international perspective of Black people in Europe, in Africa. Uh, in high school, I go to the Caribbean for the first time. My father's giving lectures. And so I have a very broad view of Europe, its interaction with the Americas. Um, later, I'll travel to Brazil, to Mexico, to the Caribbean, to many countries in Africa. I lived in Senegal for eight years. So my, my, my grandfather and grandmother's household was the environment my father grew up in. And then my parents created a rich environment for me to grow up and develop. And I've always stayed in touch with Tulsa and been interested in Tulsa. And so when I moved to the National Museum of African American History and Culture during my 30 years at the Smithsonian, um, we wanted to tell the national story, but we wanted to look at stories in different parts of the country that helped us understand the complexity of the African American experience and the diversity of that experience. And so I began talking to the curator of that exhibition, Paul Gardula, very early on saying Tulsa's story needs to be told. He said, well, that will depend on whether we find the stories, whether they are the most compelling, whether we have, it's a museum, so you have to have some artifacts and some oral histories and some photographs. And so for eight years, Paul and I came to Tulsa and met the people, went to the institutions, went in people's homes, and convince them that the story needed to be told. So we have a whole network of people and institutions in Tulsa who made it possible for us to tell the story in the power of place exhibition. And it looks at Greenwood as a story of American resilience. It looks at the growth of Greenwood, its destruction and rebirth until of course, the interstate comes through and tears the neighborhood down as the neighborhood across the country, African-American business neighborhoods across the country are destroyed by the Eisenhower interstate system. A time built at a time in the late 50s and early 60s before the Civil Rights Act, before fair housing, before the Voting Rights Act, when African-Americans really don't have the clout as neighbors in Southern Tulsa did to come to Washington and said, you are not going to build the interstate through our neighborhood. So of course, the interstate cuts right through Greenwood and uh, the neighborhood doesn't really recover after that. So I continue to read the history of Tulsa. When I reread my grandfather, I see things now that I didn't see in 97 when my father and I published my grandfather's autobiography. I was just looking at something yesterday, which I think I can find quickly, which I know will make you chuckle. It's at the beginning of my grandfather's chapter on Tulsa. And he says, chapter nine, Tulsa, 1921, bloody racial conflict. It's very short. I made two trips to Tulsa and had discussed with my wife the matter of moving there. And she agreed it was the thing to do. Before leaving Rennesville, however, there were several details to attend to. I had one or two undisposed cases in Eufaula. I vividly recall my last trip there. I took John Hope with me, my dad who's a little boy. Although just past six, 
even though he loved to mingle with great, although just past six, even then he loved to mingle with great crowds of people, prefer, preferably grown-ups. And if he could, he would strike up a conversation with any one of them. It was Saturday, the regular court motion day for settling pleadings. Lawyers that were there from all over the county and adjoining counties. The boy was all eyes and ears. Nothing escaped him. He sat beside me at the bar, within the bar. When my case came up on the docket, I arose and approached the court to present my motion. John Hope also arose and stood beside me. Every lawyer in the crowded room noticed it and laughed. The judge, Harvey Melton, looked pleased and after my pleading had been disposed of, beckoned him to the bench. How old are you? And what do you intend to do when you be when you grow up? The jurist asked. I was six years old last month, John Hope answered in a matter of fact way. I intend to be the first Negro president of the United States when I grow up. The judge could hardly stop laughing. I was too startled to laugh or do anything. When court recessed, the judge told the lawyers about his conversation with my son, and they all laughed and enjoyed it. Oh, my goodness. Oh so when you go God. back and read things like that and you see how his father took him to the court and observed his interaction with the judge. So anyway, I grew up in a rich household like that too. You meet people from all over the world. Dad traveled the world. And then he, he, we would host the people he met in Europe, in India, in Nigeria, in Brazil at our home. What what an incredible life history and childhood, which is also interwoven with the history of Tulsa, right? And what you right. what you what and and the the history of that. Um, and when you're looking at is all your work as a, a curator, a program manager, a cultural historian, what are the history or histories that you would want people across the United States, across the world, to know about Tulsa? And I know you have done a lot of that with your work with the African um, African American Museum and at the Smithsonian, really what are some of the takeaways that you would like people to have for Tulsa? Well, give me, let me give you an example. Um, for several years, I attended an international conference on just governance in Switzerland, international conference, people from over a hundred countries. And uh, one of the organizers heard me do a short presentation on Tulsa as part of a healing history, how we learn, how we heal our, our societies through understanding and confronting our history. And she asked me to do, um, to bring delegation from Tulsa to Switzerland two years in a row. And many of the people that I took in the delegation did not know each other, black, white, Latino, Asian, different age groups. And they had to confront their communities passed together and tell it to an international audience. So I had a school teacher, had a librarian, had a former mayor, had people from the historical society. And they had to tell this international group what Tulsa's history was. And I showed silent footage we have from 1921 of Greenwood smoldering. And I introduced it minimally. And as an international conference translated into various languages, we had interpreters. And everyone in the room assumed it was World War Europe after World War II. I said, no, this is the result of white supremacy in the United States in the 1920s. By then we captured the entire audience and they followed us to our workshops. And the Armenian delegation asked for a private meeting with the Tulsa delegation to discuss how do you teach suppressed history? And it was interpreted, they had in Turkish English interpreters to interpret the meeting. And Susan Savage was the mayor who made the apology to the city. And Susan was part of that private meeting with other members. I did not participate in that meeting. That was the kind of impact that Tulsa's story has on other people. So people need to understand that Tulsa's story, though unique, 
to Oklahoma and unique to the United States is a story that must be told nationally and internationally. And in having the Tulsa story as part of the National Museum of, the African, -Ameri of African American History and Culture, people from across the states and around the world get a chance to understand that this is part of our history. I, I think that's really interesting about the role of the national institutions like the um, Smithsonian and the African American History Mu Museum of History and Culture. So what role do you think that institutions like that, nationally, regional, local, should play in preserving, memorializing, and educating Americans and people from around the world about the history of Black people in this country. And I know we've been talking more specifically about Tulsa, um, which I think has a profound impact on so many things. Well, all of our cultural institutions, be they museums, galleries, theaters, have a responsibility of showing the broad range of the American experience. Um, I think this past year has taught us how much as Americans we do not know about our past. And so there's been a thirst for this knowledge, not just by African Americans, by Americans of all stripes. As I said yesterday, I spoke um, to a law firm about Tulsa and my grandmother, my grandfather in particular. And over 500 people across the country signed up for this webinar. All this past year, I've been asked to speak in different arenas um, by people who are thirsty to know more about our history. Why didn't I know this? Why has this history been suppressed? Why did I think African-American history was just slavery, Martin Luther King, President Obama, that's it. Well, there are huge gaps in our knowledge. And unfortunately, I feel that's intentional. Um, but we have the opportunity now to fill in those holes, fill in those blanks. Um, I want to take this in a slightly different tangent. Um, growing up among historians, you know that history in the United States was predominantly dominated by white males. And when dad comes in the field, this is a new set of perspectives of African-American men first being admitted to these institutions and then being able to tell parts of a national story that have been hidden, whether it's about reconstruction or slavery or the 20th century. By the time I go to college in the late 60s and early 70s, black women are starting to go to college in even greater numbers to the point that black women historians with PhDs find, create an organization of African-American women historians and start looking at the history of women that they have ignored. Not only have men ignored it, women have ignored it. And women have to be convinced that there's a story for women in women's lives. So a group of women in Buffalo created a research project called Uncrowned Queens. This is African-American women, important in their communities, but not recognized and honored. And a branch of their work took them to Black women in Oklahoma, and they discovered my grandmother. And Molly Lee Parker established, as I understand it, the first daycare center in Tulsa. She was part of the colored women Federation of Colored Women Organizations. Um, and so they asked my father to write a submission about his mother. So we have to lift up not just African-American men, but women and the key role that African-American women played in Oklahoma, in Tulsa, in Greenwood. So we have more to learn and more to explore. And I have to say, for me, this has just been um, this conversation been, has been, been profoundly important and interesting, um, and the work that you all have done in revealing this story about Tulsa, as someone who was a history major in college before I went to law school, who studied the early part of the American 20th century, I had never heard of the Tulsa Race Massacre. And I went to school in the 70s, I, we, I was never discussed. So I think that pulling this back and providing that information serves such an, a 
it's critical for us to move forward. So I, I was wondering when when you know when we look at the work at some of the truth and reconciliation commissions that we have in Canada with respect to indigenous people, South Africa with respect to the victims of apartheid. Does the United States or is there a role for truth and reconciliation of some sort in Tulsa or the United States dealing with these centuries of exploitation, persecution and suppression of stories of African Americans? And if so, what would that what would that look like? Well, it's funny that you ask. Um, in the late 90s, President Clinton asked my father to chair One America uh, and his initiative on race. And it was an interracial men and women looking at race in America. Well, unfortunately, the press thought it was something that could be solved. And they said, well, have you solved this? They come to dad and say, have you solved this situation, this situation yet? They said, no, it took hundreds of years to get to where we are now, it's going to take a long time. Um, after he had that experience of chairing the initiative on race, uh, a journalist asked me if my father had ever met Archbishop Tutu, who had by then, of course, completed the chairing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I said, no, they've never met. She said, what do you think a conversation would be like between the two of them? And so we film in Senegal a conversation between Archbishop and Dad, looking at the respective histories of their countries and the history of race and their own work trying to understand at the national level what this was. And we published that as a documentary. It's called Tutu and Franklin, A Journey Towards Peace. It came out in 2001. So it's something for us to look back at this kind of work that's already been done to help us understand what we need to do in the future. Um, but as I said, this year has, this past year has been so jarring that it has made people look at our history and curious to learn. So this is an opportune time. Um, I'm so glad that the, that the university is working on this law clinic People are still in great need of legal advice, just as they were 50 years ago, 100 years ago. And to take a clinic into neighborhoods is key because access depends on many different things, but location of advice is key. And so when I heard of your initiative to create a clinic first, regardless of what it's called, a clinic in Greenwood, in North Tulsa, to serve North Tulsa, I was pleased. And when you asked for my blessing to name it for my grandfather, I said, what better uh, person to name it for? And I sent you that picture of him in the tent. So the law clinic um, was open June 100 years ago and continues in 2021. Well, I am thrilled that we are at the centennial of the opening of your father's clinic, being able to open the new legal clinic for the College of Law serving the Greenwood and North Tulsa communities, and for you graciously allowing us to use your grandfather's name and legacy for the Buck Colbert Franklin Legal Clinic at the College of Law. Um, why can you tell us a little bit about what you hope that bringing a clinic like this to these communities will mean to Tulsa? and to the individuals who might be able to get our legal services. Well, in addition to servicing an underserved community, it might inspire some young people to go into the law and continue this process. One of the things I was discussing yesterday was how difficult it was for African-Americans to become lawyers, because you know they couldn't go to the University of Oklahoma Law School. Grandpa studied by correspondence. Uh, he apprenticed. I don't know if lawyers even think of that. It's sort of clerking as apprenticing in a way. But apprenticing as a means of uh, learning about an organization, sort of interning. So if you're in an internship and exposed to a career opportunity and have the opportunity to meet people who are lawyers, then they might say, well, I might like to do this as a career. 
So part of the legal clinic might be exposing young people to what law school is, what preparations you need to make to go to law school and meet some young men and women who maybe look like them too, who could say, well, I did it, you can do it. I think that is an incredible legacy. More people coming to law school always warms my heart. But really, I mean, a part of this clinic is serving the community and also training our law students in serving communities and being able to bring more young people into following a dream of practicing law and becoming lawyers, um, I think is absolutely wonderful. Um, do you have any last minute things you would like to share with us about your history, about your grandfather, about Tulsa? Well, I look forward to the time in a vaccinated, we resume air travel <laughs> to return to Tulsa. I used to drive to Tulsa from Chicago. It's a bit far to drive from Maryland. So I look forward to returning to Tulsa and see Tulsa grow. I miss my barbecue. We recreate it here as much as we can, but there's nothing like Tulsa barbecue. And um, I look forward to seeing the universities and how they grow. So uh, hopefully in the next year or two, we'll be able to meet face to face in Tulsa. Well, I very much hope that in a year or two, we will all be sooner rather than later, we will all be vaccinated. We can meet in person. I would love to be able to sit down with you over dinner rather than just over Zoom. And I look forward to you coming and visiting the Buck Colbert Franklin College of Law Legal Clinic. It'd be great to welcome you. Thank you. John, I look forward to that opportunity. John, thank you so much. You're most welcome. Take care.